Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and I am thrilled to be sitting here with Doug Jensen. Doug, nice to finally meet you in person. Uh, I got in touch with Doug uh, when I learned on the web that his video tutorials on the Sony FS7 were first port of call if you really wanted to know how to use the camera. And Doug, you saved my bacon. Oh, thank you. Uh, I especially liked using the profile, the Doug Jensen profile, <laughs> because it Wonder meant... Wonder why I came up with that name. <laughs> <laughs> because it meant that then I didn't have to shoot uh, RAW, I didn't have to shoot S-Log, and that made me happy. As a one-man band, there are so many things that I have to do, like anybody else in a similar situation. And with all of the compression that the internet adds to the image anyway, yep. I really love your view to capture as much of the image properly in camera as possible. Right, and that's one of the things I really like about all the Sony cameras is that they have the internal processing power to give you that option. So if you want to go with a neutral kind of look and grade in post, whether that's S-Log or some other way, and grade in post, you have that option. But you're not forced to do it that way. Uh, the Sony cameras have uh, scene files and paint menus that you can go in and you can dial in and get a final, a very nice final broadcast quality look right on board the camera. And that's something that you cannot do with a lot of other cameras that just don't have that onboard processing to basically do your grading live while you shoot if you want to look at it that way. You know, we've uh, been together for a couple of days up here at the Main Media Workshop. You've just completed a cinematography course. Uh, Good to be done. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, a your, long week, but 15 hour days for the week, yes. Wow, and, and uh, your students did a great job, so Thank really you. impressive. Uh, but we talked about a number of things, including coming from a still photography background. And I'm old enough, I'm a little bit older than you, <laughs> uh, to actually have had first a black and white and then a color darkroom and so i understand about getting an exposure right in the camera and then still having creative license in the darkroom which back then was called dodging and burning and now we have that electronically as with you were DaVinci saying. resolve if you want i you could kind of look at the modern day cameras as if you want to shoot uh ectochrome slides or kodachrome slides and just have it be done when you snap it in the camera then go to a scene file dial in some paint menus choose settings that you're going to be happy with and then maybe you do a little color correction not color grading in in your nle whether it's premiere or final cut pro or what have you uh, that's one way of going but if you want to sort of immerse yourself in the in the old darkroom style of workflow which i like that's to shoot uh, raw or s-log and now you're creating more of what i would call a digital negative that's going to have to be developed and sometimes you don't even know quite what you've got until you get into that digital darkroom which is davinci resolve and, and the whole workflow and process and the discovery of what you can do in there i really enjoy it it's everything except for the smell of the chemicals on your hands you actually had an idea for a product <laughs> didn't you oh yeah yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll mention it here maybe someone will do it because i'll buy it and that's a, an air freshener that you like a little pine tree that you hang in your car. I want one that I hang in my edit bay that smells like a uh, Kodak developer. Yeah. Yeah, D76 <laughs> or Fixer or something like that. So I get a little whiff of that and make me feel like I'm back in the old darkroom days. I would love that. Well, I'm glad that we're having this conversation as a precursor to the main event, which is the FS5 RAW, because it's as much about philosophy as, as anything else. Right. Now, uh, as I said, I regarded the FS5 as a great move-up camera. Yes. Uh, from things like the Sony A7R, A7S, and uh, Canon 5D Mark whatever, Nikon D whatever. Yes. Because when you get to a dedicated video camera, things change. If you haven't used a dedicated professional video camera and your experience has mostly been with SLRs and stuff, and you like the look of the SLRs, we live in a great time because a few years ago it was either an SLR or a regular video camera with a small sensor, not really much latitude for as far as dynamic range and stuff goes. But now, and I will give Canon full credit for this, of driving and being the instigator of the big large format revolution over the past you know, five, ten years or so, uh, and now we can reap the benefits of it. And now the, 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 the look and the style of that big sensor camera has come to, has been merged in with the, with the features of a professional camcorder that professionals like myself 
There was no way I was going to do anything on an SLR. The, 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 the look and the style of that was excellent, but I could not give up all the other things, XLR audio inputs, headphone monitoring, uh, playback, custom clip naming, all kinds of things that I need in a, in a professional, zebras, peaking, all those kind of things I need in a professional camcorder. So now we're living a great time where all those things have merged together and we can have the best of both worlds. And to me, I, I'm a big Sony fan because I think that their cameras kind of tick all of those boxes the best for me. So, so you, you mentioned Canon and full props really are do them. It was their 5D Mark II. I've been a Canon guy all the way back to the FTQL uh -huh. in the early 70s and then went through the high-end film cameras, the uh, F1, then to uh, the EOS 3 actually was the last film uh, camera that I had. And when Canon went digital, uh, I started with the 1D, the original 1D, and got as far as the 5D Mark II with video. That really put me over the edge. That was resulted in a change in my life for what I would do. People that can work with an SLR like that and get the look that they get, I'm amazed because I don't think I could do that with an SLR, what I see other people doing. And I, I'm, I'm very impressed by that work because I've got to have my camcorder tools and stuff, okay? Well, I and, need those things. But I love the I love that look. So I, I'm very impressed when people I see these great wedding videos being done and other things that are really cinematic with those cameras. It really is it really is excellent work. And it's really interesting coming from you. I think we need to let people know a little bit about your background and what kind of gear you've used over the years. I started, you know, back in the old three quarter inch days, Umatic, if you want to call it that. I advanced to beta cam and then I advanced to uh, high definition. I was one of the early adopters really on the professional side. My first uh, high definition camera was a, uh, a Sony Z1U, which I still own. It's a, it was a HDV camcorder, but wasn't bad. Then progressed through some of the Sony's um, uh, regular camcorders, uh, shoulder mount camcorders, beta cam style stuff. Uh, and, then, uh, and then when the F3 came out, that was my first big sensor camera. And that kind of launched me. It's like, ah, oh, wow, this is totally different. I want to go this direction. And I never looked back after that. So currently, my main camera that I shoot most of my stuff on is a Sony F55, which I have the R5 raw recorder on the back of that. So I can er very easily shoot 16-bit raw, uncompressed files with the F55. And that is my main workhorse camera. That's what I use. But I also own an FS7 which is a fantastic camera and to me to me the FS7 is the best bang for the buck of any camera in history bar none the FS7 is the best value of a camera ever but stepping down from there, I also have an FS5. And an FS5, to me, doesn't quite reach the same standards of an FS7 in more uh, features and functions ways, not so much in image quality ways. But it's a good stepping stone, usually, from people coming up from a mirrorless camera or an SLR. That's how I would describe the FS5, is like, if you've got a few extra thousand bucks, the FS7 takes you to a new level and I would encourage somebody to maybe jump make the jump to an FS7 if they're looking at going up but if you want if you can't go up to that rung on the ladder and you want to stop at the SF5 that's a very capable camera also and that's what makes this raw upgrade so interesting because the promise at any rate yep. is that you now have a path to get to FS7 level image quality and FS7 uh, 7 image manipulation capability uh, in chunks. Right. So if a, a, a Sony uh, A7R2 is 3200 and a, a Canon 5D Mark IV is 3500, uh, you, if you can pull together two grand, you can climb up to the next yes. rung and get into uh, the FS5 dedicated video cam. No overheating issues, <laughs> okay. Uh, and that one doesn't even come up into my mind because I've never had any camera that had overheating issues. So like to have that even that perspective is like, oh, no overheating issues. I don't even think about that. <laughs> lucky guy. Lucky guy. Actually, luck has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Cameraman uh, getting coffee, by the way. That's what this show is called, right? Cameron getting, uh, Cameraman getting coffee. <laughs> so, so, right. Um, so let's actually begin to talk about RAW. Okay. So the RAW upgrade on the FS5 is a five or six hundred dollar uh, from Sony a license Sony, key that you have to upgrade key. yeah five or six hundred dollars yes, which that. is which is I have to say the most bizarre access mechanism I've ever seen very complicated but 
This is no to, complaint. To install the to, key? Just to install it. Oh, key. I totally agree with that. Uh, yeah. I totally agree with that. Okay. But yes, really, that, that is a convoluted system. Okay, yes. I yes. feel better. Uh, <laughs> but ultimately, neither here nor there. Uh, but once you get locked in, you're good to go. It's just getting over that hump of getting it installed. Good luck to you. Exactly. <laughs> and and then there is precisely one recorder on the market at the moment, uh, Convergent Designs Odyssey 7Q Plus. Yes, I love the Odyssey. Which can handle that that stream. Yes. And that stream out of the camera is only available through SDI. Yes, okay. yes. So Which some, is fantastic because I hate HDMI. I, th that is the, you, you, we were talking earlier about the bane of your existence, certain things. Yes. HDMI, I don't want to have anything to do with HDMI if I can avoid it. So having that locking, nice, solid cable in, in SDI, is, that's fantastic right I think there, that's alone. a lovely example of just <laughs> one small difference between us because I hate micro HDMI <laughs> and I'd love to get to HDMI yes. and the FS5 actually in addition to the SDI connector has full HDMI. But there are other limitations when you go to RAW. Doug, what are they? Uh, as I said, I have an F55 and I shoot RAW mostly, mostly I shoot RAW if it's my own material. I do a lot of stock footage, I do a lot of high-end you know, product kind of stuff for clients and things, and I shoot RAW and that kind of stuff. Now if I was doing an interview like this, would I be shooting RAW? Absolutely not. No benefit to that. And but we're not shooting RAW. Yes. We're not even <laughs> shooting 4K. <laughs> um, so, so I'm a big fan of RAW and I do it mostly. And if I'm not shooting RAW, then I'm shooting some version of S-Log. I hardly ever myself use a baked in look or WYSIWYG look or whatever you might want to call it that we talked about earlier. I'm mostly using RAW or S-Log. So I've enjoyed S-Log on the uh, F55 and when, they get, when we had the ability now to do RAW on the FS7 and the FS5, and I haven't done much with the FS7 yet, but with the FS5 I thought, I'm going to take my 7Q Plus, which I already have. I'm going to get the licenses. I'm going to get the raw bundle from uh, Convergent Design. I'm going to invest in that, and I'm going to put it through its paces and see if uh, if if raw is worth it. Because I love raw on the F55. So does that translate to the FS5? And that was my question because I'm the kind of person like show me. I have to do the testing. I don't just assume I'm based on paper. Oh. Raw, yes, it must look fantastic. It must be better. It must be easier to grade. I like to test these things myself. I'm not just in not just raw, but any camera setting. I like to uh, run it through my own testing and see from my own eyes whether this is something worth using, something embracing or not. We we actually had a little bit of this discussion yesterday, and my my view was uh, if it is a feature that's supposed to really add something significant that I happen to want, yes. then I'm right with you. Yes. But on the other hand, I don't need to sit and drive a Range Rover to know that the Range Rover is not the car for me. So that's another reason why I love having you here because you are very disciplined and this feature really is important because in addition to the five to six hundred dollars for the Sony license, if you don't already have the Odyssey 7Q Plus, that's a two thousand dollar plus uh, purchase. By the time you put SSD cards and stuff in. SSD yeah. cards. And then there's another uh, fee for the conversion to unlock the RAW. Yeah, about $1,000 or so. And I think you can rent that on a daily basis if you just need it occasionally or something. But still, if you're going to buy it and use it all the time, yeah, it's about $1,000. So you're up around, you know, what, 2000 for the unit and drives, 1000 for that. And then there's 600 or so to Sony. So you're into it around 3600 or so on top of the cost of the camera just to be able to do the RAW. So you've just added, you know, quite a bit to the cost of the camera. Right, and in fact, you've now pushed it over the price of an FS7 without RAW, and it was interesting to hear that with the FS7, by and large, you're not using RAW. Is that because the FS7 has the XAVC I codec available? That would it? be one of the reasons. I'm, I, I think I would be less likely to see a difference there, and um, it's just, uh, I figured I would start by evaluating the FS5 first and see if I liked RAW on, with that camera. I have not put the FS7 through the same testing between RAW and internal like I have with the FS5. Now I'll probably do that someday if I, you know, if I decide that I might want to shoot RAW. I would want to do the testing to see if it's worth it or not because I look at a lot of these kind of functions as it's like a balance. It's like scales of justice balance. On the one hand, you've got you want improved picture quality if you if you do certain things, but almost all of those things always come with extra cost or extra hassle. 
So sometimes the, you will give up a little bit of extra, the, the, you won't need net maximum quality, but you'll gain a lightweight, easier to maneuver camera or smaller file size or something. So everything is a little bit of balance and one production might be like this, another production might be like this, but it's important to know how those two things balance out so you can make intelligent decisions as to when to do what. You, you make a really wonderful point. Uh, I had the FS5 in for a while, a pile of Zacuto gear. I had the Odyssey 7Q Plus in for a little while. I did not have enough time to test it. I had to give it back. But as soon as you talk about RAW, uh, again, you have to talk about that recorder. And now you want battery power. You want battery power. And I have a, an Anton Bauer Cine 150 and a Zacuto to slap it all together. Yep. And it becomes a very, very different camera. When I first got the FS5, the first thing I did is take off the handle and said, oh my God, I've got yeah. something the size of a Contax 645. It is 645. tiny, strip it down, okay. absolutely. So you've got that, it's, uh, we talked about this again yesterday and it's a bit like, a, I think of it as a balloon. You squeeze in one place, it's gonna yes, get larger someplace analogy. else. Yes, that's a great analogy, yes. So, okay, fine. Uh, you now have the capability to do RAW on the FS5. It tips the balance as far as uh, uh, compact dimensions, it gets much heavier. The problem is, is that it's not a scale like this where one goes up equally as one goes down. It's more like, it's more like quality goes up, but hassle or expense goes way down. It's not, it's not a, it's not a one for one ratio. It's cool. like a little bit higher, boom. What's the actual difference in image quality? What's your experience with it? So what I did was I decided, well, I'm gonna put the Odyssey on the camera and I'm gonna go out and I'm going to shoot a bunch of video in different situations, uh, stuff with a lot of detail, with a lot of places where I might see banding and highlights and that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna shoot internal, because this is a nice thing about the camera. I can shoot internal HD at the same time I output RAW to the Odyssey. And the Odyssey has a couple of different ways that you can record the raw signal. You can record it as Cinema DNG files, which is huge file sizes. And I didn't go to that level because there's no way for my personal stuff that I'm gonna shoot Cinema DNG files. But you can also take that output out of the camera into the Odyssey 7Q+, and you can uh, convert that into ProRes, ProRes HQ, ProRes Lite, whatever you want at 4K or HD or whatever. So what I wanted to do is look at ProRes HQ uh, 4K, which is you know, basically the best uh, ProRes that I could get on the Odyssey, uh, and record that from the FS5 and compare that to what I could do internally just in HD, because I can't do 4K on the camera, in, on board the camera at the same time I'm outputting RAW. I can only do HD on, on board the camera. So it's a little bit of a mismatch there. But nevertheless, to be honest, most of the stuff, we, even if we shoot 4K, we're still mostly taking that stuff down to an HD timeline right now, right? I mean, who's delivering anything in 4K? Really nobody yet. We shoot for 4K because 4K acquisition has a lot of advantages of it if you bring that into an HD timeline. So that's really a real world scenario of how I would use it anyway. So to compare the internal HD versus the external 4K, um, I decided to mount both those on the camera at the same time and just go out on Labor Day weekend when I had nothing better to do and go around and shoot a bunch of different footage and then bring those into post, do a split screen wipe and see is there a difference and if there is a difference, how big of a difference and is it worth the extra hassle and expense of doing the raw recorder. I am so excited to share this with uh, you, our viewers, uh, because you're talking about 4K, uh, raw, what is it, 12-bit, 14? 12-bit, yes. So 12 that's a little bit bit? different than the FS5, FS, F55 RAW, because the F55 RAW is uncompressed 16-bit going to Sony's RAW format. Here on the FS5, we're going RAW to ProRes HQ and with only a 12-bit signal coming in. So I knew right going out the gate that it could not be as good, at least on paper, as the F55 RAW. But the question is, did it give me a big step up from the internal recording? The FS5, uh, HD is 10-bit 422. Yes. So it's not 8-bit 420. It's it's not the the same space as uh, the the Canon cameras until the 5D Mark IV, which apparently is 8-bit 422. Yeah, or the A7S II or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I was looking for locations in our area uh, with things like, as we'll see, clouds, old rusty cars, brick buildings, fog, um, just a variety of flowers, just a little variety of whatever I could find to go and shoot. Now the one thing I don't have is faces. That's one thing lacking from this test is human faces, which again uh, accounts for a lot of what we shoot, but unfortunately 
Uh, I've run out of family and friends that will volunteer to let me shoot them, and I wasn't going to hire models for this. I wasn't going to put out that money. So I'm making judges bait. And, and a lot of stuff I shoot is stock footage and nature and stuff anyway. So from my standpoint, that is, the, that is important stuff for me to check out. Did you think through uh, shooting things which would allow differences to emerge? Uh, so, uh, were you looking for settings that had very wide dynamic range? Yes. Or were you looking for scenes? Lots of detail. Yes. So, just talk yes. a little bit about that. Lots of detail, uh, fine detail, um, high dynamic range, uh, bright highlights like in some clouds, uh, things with intense colors like, uh, like yellow on flowers and stuff. And then I was fortunate enough to have some fog on the weekend. So, Fog is a kind of, I think that's sometimes tough on, um, on the uh, compression uh, of the cameras, is to make fog look good without getting blocky or banding and stuff. Oh, and so I wanted artifacts. to see how the fog looks. So I was lucky enough to be blessed with some fog that weekend. Uh, and so um, that's about it. I just kind of found whatever I could find. It's, uh, it's fun to go out and shoot. That's, that's my passion, is just to go out and shoot. I do a lot of stock footage, but it's not so much the stock footage that drives me, it's the fun going out and shooting. And if I can make money on the stock footage later, that's just icing on the icing cake. Icing on the cake. I just enjoy shooting. It's fantastic, <laughs> which reminds me of my friend, the ear, nose, and throat specialist, but I'll <laughs> save that for a little bit later. Uh, one might argue that in not doing faces, you potentially missed an opportunity to highlight a difference between raw and internal recording. I recall you saying to me, that on the F55, that's one thing that RAW uh, really does give you a boost for. You said you like the colors better. A 16-bit color on the F F F55 just gives me a tremendous amount of range for grading and post. And um, when I say grading and post, I'm talking about running it through DaVinci Resolve. If you're going to make the commitment to shoot with RAW or even S-Log, I am a firm believer um, people can take my advice or not, but I'm a firm believer that you must also take the, uh, make the commitment to grade through Resolve. There's other programs, Base Light, maybe even Speed Grade, stuff like that. But you've got to go through a dedicated program, uh, grading program, if you really want to take advantage of the, of the really tremendous power that these cameras are offering us. If you're going to try and wimp out, and I would say wimp out, uh, and do your grading in Final Cut Pro or, or, uh, or, uh, or um, Premiere or something like that, you're cutting yourself off at the knees. If you're gonna do S-Log or RAW, you've got to go with Resolve and do it right. I'm a, I'm a real firm believer in that. You've just complicated my life. I've been <laughs> trying to stay away from that. Although, I have to say, when I saw uh, uh, Da Vinci last year uh, in New York City at a Black Magic event, I was pretty blown away by it. But you're not suggesting that, that one switch from Final Cut Pro, I hope you're not, no. uh, or Adobe Premiere to DaVinci Resolve as a full alley. Absolutely not, no. I, I imagine there are some people trying to make that change. I know Blackmagic is trying to turn uh, uh, Resolve into a full-blown non-linear editor. I, I don't even, I, whether they achieve that or not, I don't care because I'm firmly entrenched in Premiere. And I like the, I'm a big Adobe fan. I like the way Premiere integrates with all the other Adobe suite. Um, I'm one of the people that likes their subscription payment plan. I actually embrace that and I love that freedom of that. Uh, and so I will not be giving a Premiere anytime soon. Resolve a strictly used for grading and maybe doing a rough cut on some of the shots just to kind of trim the tail or the head or something like that and just kind of get rid of some of the garbage. But there's a couple different paths you could take Resolve depending on what I'm shooting. Sometimes I will shoot the footage and grade just the shots that I know I'm going to use in Resolve and then I bring those into Premiere and now I'm working with in Premiere with stuff that's already been pre-graded. Uh, sometimes there's too much material for that and I haven't really made my decisions on what I want to use so I'll go the opposite route and I will take the footage and I will bring that raw ungraded footage into Premiere, do my rough cut edit in there when I'm finished then I will export that as an XML file to Resolve, I do my grading on just the shots that got used and then spit that back to Premiere and it all relinks back in. Either way it's pretty seamless, but the, uh, but the resolve needs to be 
I, I look at that as grading only, strictly only, and that's an important part of my workflow no matter what. I, everything I do runs through Resolve. You give me some footage that you think is pr nearly perfect, it's excellent. I'm going to do this. That hasn't been through I'm Resolve. I'm going to do this. You send me some footage and I'll make it look better and I will get you to admit that it looks better. Anything will look better. I look at stuff that I shot a few years ago that I thought, this is really good, this looks great, this looks good. Now I want to go back and look at that stuff and I think, hmm, what could I do with that now in Resolve? It's like, Oh, I wish I'd had Resolve years ago. I'm just going to tell you, <laughs> I'm nodding and I'm smiling, but inside I'm going, I hope he's wrong. I hope he's wrong because I, more work is not something that I want to do. I, it's I not a, more work, it's fun. Did okay, you like your, so, did so you like now, your dark room? Did you like your black and white dark room? Did you enjoy that to a certain I, extent? I did, Okay. but life was much simpler and I was much younger then. And you can apply the amount of effort that you want to it. If you want to, let's say you go out and shoot a bunch of footage, and it's all relatively similar, all well exposed in camera, and it's all kind of similar stuff. Once you come up with a look for that footage, you can pretty much apply that to all your clips and very quickly. I mean, you, it's not, grading is not something that you should be spending, you know, half an hour on every shot or something like that. It's something where, and I'm doing my stock footage, I'm, I may be grading a shot in maybe 30 seconds or so. But the beautiful thing about, but Resolve just gives you so much power, especially with the power windows and the gradients and stuff, because hardly ever do I want to apply the same grade to your whole shot here. I might want to darken up this window over there. I might want to darken the sky. I might want to put a vignette around your head, a very subtle thing. I might want to sharpen up this part. That can all be done very quickly, and you're not going to be able to do that kind of detail control in Premiere. I am actually afraid. I understand that. Uh, so do you have anything uh, that you can? And, uh, give me to help me? I mean, other than drugs. No, in my classes that I teach here in Maine, um, no matter what the class is, I make sure to spend at least, you know, maybe a couple hours one afternoon and we go through Resolve uh, because everything we do, we also want to grade in my class also. So I go through the, even though it's not a, a grading class, and I don't consider myself a professional colorist by any mind. Don't, 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 don't think, well now he, Doug thinks he's a cameraman, he thinks he's an editor, he thinks he's a colorist. No, I'm not a colorist. I am a cameraman who knows his way around Resolve and has done enough trial and error over the last two or three years that I feel confident and teaching other people what I know. Well, take us through it because this is really, really interesting. I recorded internally and externally, and I decided to do an unusual kind of way to compare them, and that's to mirror image one side of it so that we do see both parts of the frame on, on both sides rather than squeezing them back into boxes or other ways that you might do a side-by-side -side comparison. I like to do my side-by-side -side comparisons this way. It's so on the clever. So on the left-hand side, yeah, I kind of like the way it looks. It's fun to watch. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we see what came out of the FS5 via the raw output to the Odyssey 7Q Plus and, record, and was recorded as 4K ProRes HQ. On the right, we see what was recorded internally, just on a little cheap SD cards uh, in uh, HD 10-bit 422. And uh, so in post, uh, there's all S-Log. Uh, oh, and also with uh, the right-hand side would have been recorded with uh, the built-in picture profile number seven on board the FS7, which is S-Log2, S-Gamut. And that's, what, that's the setting that you need to have at this time on the Odyssey 7Q+. Plus. That's what you need to feed to the Odyssey. You can't feed it S-Log3, it doesn't want that. It expects to see S-Log2. So the picture profile for that on board the FS5 is picture profile seven. And this is with a minimum ISO of 1600 or 3200? I, the, yeah, the camera says 3200, that's not correct. I, in my course of doing my training video, my six hour training video, I got very deep into the uh, FS5. I graded the camera in many different modes. Uh, some of the picture profiles, some of the different gammas and S-Log, and I found the camera is really more like around 2500 in S-Log, and that's if you expose it at Sony's recommended level. I personally don't believe in exposing it at Sony's recommended level, which just, uh, we don't want to get too sidetracked on this, but Sony's recommended level would be to put whites at about 60%. Uh, um, here we see, I'm just going to, going to go through um, Sony's, Sony's recommended level is to expose S-Log at 60% whites. I prefer to expose whites at around 70 to 75%. So I am over exposing by about a stop or a stop and a half. So this footage here with the camera, if you want to talk about ISO, I'm not a believer in talking about ISO on a video camera. Um, that's nomenclature that I don't believe in. I believe it should be gain. But anyway, that's a subject for another podcast. Uh, <laughs> if you want to talk about ISO, this is probably exposed 
more like around ISO 1000 oh, uh, or so, something, something in that range. 1000 or 800 is how I'm exposing this, if you want to look at it in those terms of that. Okay, all right. So, um, and uh, grading on the left-hand side there, I just applied a very light grade, basically the recommended LUTs that Convergent Design, the manufacturers of the 7Q Plus, uh, suggest as a as a baseline standard grade for for the stuff that for the raw footage for FS5. I noticed a, a little difference left to right in that little purple bit. Yes, there there are definitely differences from side to side. Um, and then on the right hand side, I just applied the same LUT on that side. But then because the color is a little bit different, because we're talking about 10 bit versus 12 bit and ProRes and stuff, I just kind of just gave a little bit of grade to the right hand side there, the internal, just to try and match them a little bit closer. Okay. So a lot of it still doesn't match that well, but I only spent all this stuff, seriously, I graded in about an hour. So again, it doesn't take a lot of time to grade with Resolve. Well, and I could make a match better if I wanted to. I just didn't put that much well, effort into uh, it. I'm blown away because right now, 4K versus 1080p, 12-bit RAW versus 10-bit, I'm not seeing and again, with all humility, I am not seeing a significant difference, Doug. No, and I don't see a huge difference either. And um, you know, we're looking at something on uh, you know that's been compressed. It's on the web, and that's what you know, our viewers are looking at also. Big so issue. some of that gets Big washed issue. out. Yep. But I have the advantage of looking at it on my grading suite on 10-bit monitors and seeing the differences. And um, I would say there is some differences. The differences that I see when I look at it are. I prefer the colors on the raw side, the left side. I prefer the colors. I think the colors look more natural. Sometimes they're a little less garish when you get into high saturated stuff like some of the flowers. Now, it's possible that I could probably even that out with a little bit more grading on the right hand side footage, the internal. But nevertheless, I will say that the, the, the stuff that was recorded from the raw output, that I like the colors and the, it's a little sharper and a little bit more detail on that side. But I would say that that footage on the left-hand side that may not come through on the web is also definitely noisier also in the blacks and the mid-tones. Um, one of the, the reasons for that is noisier. Yes, the raw is noisier, absolutely. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because when the camera does the internal uh, processing, it applies some internal noise reduction and before it gets recorded on the SD card. Whereas on the raw output, it's spitting that out with really no inter with no noise reduction and added. So. It's definitely noisier uh, when, uh, especially before you grade it. After you apply the LUT, a lot of the noise kind of disappears as it's brought down. And I think in Resolve, you could add some noise reduction on there, or you know, your other NLE, you could probably add some noise reduction on there too. But boy, I hate to add noise reduction in post because in Resolve, your great your rendering speed goes down tremendously oh, yeah, as soon as you oh, start yeah, adding right. in uh, any noise reduction. I'm, I'm seeing slight differences in color. They are uh, noticeable only because they're different. I think that if I yes. were looking at one uh, footage or the other clip, I wouldn't notice it right. at all. Now, again, I, I want to be very clear. I understand this is just my opinion, yep. and I'm a, typically a statistical outlier, and I don't mind that, yep. but I'm, I'm really quite taken by this. And so I, I find myself thinking, if you're a one-man band or a two or three, so again with these, what are the pussy willows? Yeah, pussy I, I willows see, and fog very, there coming off the pond in the early very morning. very slight difference. I definitely see uh, more clarity in the fog uh, on the left with the ProRes. But this is me looking at it like, like my life depends on it. If I'm a corporate client, even if I'm a moviegoer, I don't think that, that I would notice the difference at all. Uh, but again, that's me. So this is really interesting. I guess the question that- It's not just you, it's me too, because I would okay. agree with that analysis also. Okay, all right. Well then, I guess the question, Doug, is for whom is a jump from 10-bit 422 XAVC-L yeah. to 12-bit yes. RAW 
worthwhile? What, what do you think? Well, that's something that people have to make their own decision about. I just kind of do the testing. When I posted this on Vimeo, I didn't, I didn't add any of my opinions on there. I just said, here's testing I did for my own purposes. If you can benefit by looking at it, good, come to your own conclusions. Um, and maybe you can't come to the same conclusions I might because you're not looking at as, as pristine of an image as I am. But it really does come down to the old scale thing again. Okay, if you can apply some noise reduction to it in post, I would say that the uh, raw recorded to the, to the 7Q is a little bit better. So is it better enough to justify the $3,600 expense and the hassle of having the Odyssey connected to the camera, powering that, huge file sizes. For me to shoot this, this little project here I did, uh, I believe, if I remember right, it was about 240 gigabytes of raw footage versus about 23 gigabytes of internal. Wow. So we're talking ten about a 10 to one. 1 difference or so in, in amount of footage. Is that worth it for somebody? I don't know. It, 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 is that something that someone would have to come to their own conclusion on? But I think that it is a mistake to just assume based on specifications alone or it's raw so it must be noticeably better. It's going to be fantastic. I think it's wrong to assume that and that I would encourage someone to uh, not just go by my test, but if you're going to make that investment, rent a 7Q plus or, or do something to go out and do your own testing before you, till you really make that leap and see if it's going to make enough of a difference in your book. Because one of the best things about the FS5, and this is why I have it, is because it is, as you were talking about before, it is a small, nimble, little camera. And I love, I love that whole, that's what I use it for. Handheld, run and gun stuff, light and nimble. Now, if I start to throw a 7Q plus on there, now it's not so light and nimble and all that kind of stuff. It kind of destroys the reasons that I got the camera. But on the other hand, I have the benefit of having an F55 I can use for other things. Now, if I just had an FS5 and that was my only camera, then maybe it's good to be able to have the internal when I need that light and nimble, and I'm not gonna go shoot a documentary B-roll stuff on the Odyssey, but if I'm doing a high-end uh, product shot for a client or uh, maybe green screen uh, shot or something, something I really want maximum image quality, it might be nice to be able to throw it into the raw mode and do certain shots in the uh, in raw well this is absolutely illuminating <laughs> so i want to thank you for that uh one of the things that you did yesterday and you you're keeping on it uh, even today is your da vinci resolve shaming me you're telling me that a professional uh, needs to know da vinci resolve okay um can i give one more other advice to the people out there if you're going to use da vinci resolve also you can't grade in NLE, you can't grade in NLE, you can do color correct in NLE. I'm a firm believer, and you can take my advice if you want to or not. I'm a firm believer that if you want to use RAW or, or, or LOG, you should grade in Resolve. And you all shouldn't be grading to computer monitors either. You should also be outputting that footage somehow to a regular true video monitor. And whether that's a really nice TV you bought at Best Buy or something like that, quite often those look good enough. I have a 40 inch old 10 year old Bravia that I use for part of my grading. I also have a professional 17 inch monitor to use also, but they don't look that different. I could grade to the, to the consumer TV if I want to much better than I could grade to a computer monitor. You said something very interesting yesterday. You said, for, for someone coming from my end of the pool, the shallow end of the pool, 2,000 bucks is a, a lot of money. So to go from a, a 5D Mark III at 35, or four at 3,500 uh, to a 5,500 FS5, that's a stretch, but it may be doable. But then going another uh, 2,500 up to the uh, FS7, that, that's tough. But you made the point, uh, and, and I make the point as well, that it's, yes, it's about the gear, but no, it's not about the gear. It, it's about the person. And you said, in particular, if you're thinking of upping your game, I'm going to use different language to make the same point that you've made uh, several times today. Go to Resolve first. Before you go and get another camera, Sure. go to Resolve first. Sure. And another thing that you've said time and time again, which I really appreciate, is that it's a clause, it's a qualifier that you use all the time. If you expose it right in the camera. Yes. Now, one of the things about RAW uh, one of the things that is great in RAW on the still photography side, and I expect it to be the same way uh, in footage, is that you can really manipulate the exposure the way you can't with a compressed bit of footage. It, right. It falls apart. Right, right. But the flip side is, if you've exposed it right, this is a non 
issue. That is really a key because uh, sometimes some of the argument I've heard from people saying, well, I want to shoot raw because I can really do a lot of gradient manipulation of it because it won't fall apart as quickly as 8-bit or 10-bit will. And I'm thinking, what is it that you're doing that you got to push it around that much for? And if you're exposing properly and you've got good composition and good other stuff going on, you're not talking about pushing and doing a lot of manipulation. It's light touch to bring it out. And so if the difference between 16-bit and 10-bit and is because you've got to really manipulate, I'd say, mm, maybe reevaluate how you're shooting that footage. Maybe a little more place. training. Doug, Good. man, it's been great to well, meet you in person. Thanks for coming up. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So listen, uh, Doug has those courses uh, on the FS7, FS5. I think of it as required viewing. I hope <laughs> Thank you, you really do so. the DaVinci Resolve bit. Because, yeah, so I might do this winter. Okay, okay. so I, I would love to see that. And I want to thank our hosts here at Mainline Media Workshops and College uh, in Rockport, Maine. Uh, I used to spend my summers up here, and yeah. I, I love it. It's a great summer. time of year to be up here, too. I get in the schedule, my schedule, so I'm up here in the fall instead of in the heat of the summer. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. Doug Jensen has been my thank guest. You. If you like what you've seen here, please, thumbs up subscribe, go over to the blog, hughbrownstone.com, go and follow me on Twitter, follow Doug on uh, any of these social No place, media. I'm not on no social place. media. He's just actually doing work. I'm too busy okay. working, yeah, I just, I don't want to, I go. just don't even get me started on I social think that's, media. I think that's just perfect. <laughs> Here's the story on the ENT, Ear, Nose, and Throat Specialist. Okay. Yes. This guy told me uh, advice that he gave his daughter, which I thought was very wise and then very disgusting. He said, find something not only that you love, but where the most mundane portions of it you love too. He proceeded to tell me that he loved to clean people's ears, and I, I just drew the line there. <laughs> no, I'm not going there. No, no. no.